This is the Gary V Audio Experience. Cause we're gonna be legends. Gonna get their attention. The Maple Parlor asks, what's your best piece of advice for a first generation American entrepreneur venturing out on her own away from her family business? April, first and foremost, uh, India just shared some other photos from your Instagram besides your question and your product looks delicious. Uh, There's a pretty known thing amongst the most hard maniacs is that when I go on book tour, I always start at Powell's in Portland. So, uh, you know, I'm on this hardcore diet, but uh, I think we may have to sneak in when we do that February, March, April of next year and try you out. You know, look, I think, I think the uh, biggest thing that I tell everybody is number one, practicality. How much money do you have to stay alive for how long? That is always my biggest fear. First time entrepreneurs make this mistake. Do you have one year's worth of rent and overhead? And then you have to make your actions respond to your bleeding of cash before you turn a profit. When you start a new business, especially an ice cream parlor, you know, a, a restaurant kind of, you know, what you're doing, you've got to make sure that you know, you're putting up upfront investment financially, not just time. It's not like you're building something with code. You're literally you know, paying rent and buying supplies. And so you need to have a high level of practicality. The other thing that I tell entrepreneurs that are more practical, again, a physical location, you know, it sounds like the way you asked the question, that you're leaving your own family's business and doing your own thing. You know, hopefully it's not competing directly with your own family's business, so there's not some weirdness. Um, I think the uh, thing that you really need to pay attention to is you have made a decision that does not allow you in year one any time to do anything but build your business. You are not allowed, you're almost not even allowed to watch the Ask Gary Vee show going forward. Like, you are in such a code red zone that every minute, call it, 18 hours a day out of 24, if you want this to be successful, need to be allocated for your business, uh, you know, even at the mercy in year one of your family time. Even at the mercy of that. And so I, I guess what I'm getting at, and you can tell by my tone and vibe on this question, is I'm scared and I think one of the biggest reasons so many people go out of business in the first year, first two years, small business, practical, where they're burning cash, is they don't realize how hard it is and how all in you have to be. And so if you really want this dream to come true, you've gotta make substantial sacrifices. Andrew asked, my investor wants to change the name of my company's brand, Sasquatch Fuel. Should I change the name to something that includes the name of our unique pouch like OmniFuel? Andrew, I think a lot of people that are watching this show are gonna say, he's about to go crazy and be like, screw your investor, stick to your guns. Truth is, I'm a very funny guy when it comes to names. I think execution is everything, and I think the name is literally irrelevant. Like, you know, what did Google mean to anybody before, you know, it became something? What did the word Nike mean to anybody before Nike made it happen? Like, my last name is Vaynerchuk. You know, like, they used to teach you in Hollywood before you build a brand. Like, I would have been Gary Smith you know, in, in 1961 if I went to Hollywood and did this. Like, Names don't mean crap. What you make that name mean is the real game. And so, you know, you want to be a pushover? I'm just kidding. You want to, uh, you want to change your name? Great. You, you, want, like, you don't want to change your name? Great. Like, bottom line is, is your product good? Are you going to be able to, to market? I mean, you know, what's the other name that he's considering changing it to? He said they have a, their pouch is called Omni. So like yeah, I like Sasquatch better than Omni. It's something I remember better than Omni. Like, everything's Omni. And so... And so, yeah, that's it. That's all I got. What's going on, Gary? This is John Max here. I had a question for you. I was driving and listening to Thank You Economy, and at the end of the book, you talk about how you would wish the, self, the book would self-destruct by 2015 because marketers would have ruined the Thank You Economy. Looking back, do you think that we still live in a Thank You Economy? And if not, what kind of economy do we live in now? Thank you. So I'll take a little bit of this because I'll I'll help you. Thank you economy's premise is pretty simple which is can we scale one-on-one behavior? What's what's depth versus Mm -hmm. width, right? You think of influencers, a place that you and I have both played. Mm -hmm. Like you could have a million followers but if you said go buy this book, both you and I know that somebody with 72,000 followers could sell more books. Depth. 
Uh, it didn't play out the way I wanted because I had optimism in a place where I shouldn't, which is the punchline is businesses don't give a fuck. No. It is unbelievable how much people don't understand why so my nice. whole world has worked. My little thing works because I just want to go deep. I just want to mm-hmm. deliver value and it works every time. And the person who scaled the thank you economy the best in my opinion is Taylor Swift mm-hmm. and that's why she's winning. Yep. She understands by... About her in the book, actually. That's great. So great segue, perfect. I'm glad we can pass the book. By the book. Uh, <laughs> Do some sort of scary thing there, by the way. Edit. Um, you know, I think I think Taylor understands that going to somebody's wedding randomly may cost her 45 minutes and yeah. not have an ROI positive game, but it does because the pickup, the yeah. amplification, dropping a pop-up shop for these glasses for Snapchat in the Grand Canyon is not ROI positive until everybody talks about it through this kind of infrastructure right. and then it does. Thank You Economy has a lot of DNA ties to this and to your question, the reason it didn't play out the way I'd hoped or inspired is companies are short term, I'm long term and people that are thinking in 20 and 30 and 40 year terms are thinking about LTV and lifetime value and then do things that don't have value in the short term. The reality is 99% of the players don't play that way. It's, look, you and I have been in the same business and, and I think have the same values. It's remarkably frustrating when you try to convince a brand to do what you're talking about, to go deep and to actually attach yourself to a set of values or people that have those values. You know, I always say make the content that matters, put it in front of the people it matters to, from voices that matter to them at a time that matters. It's like very simple and they never get it and they only want the top 1% of people and they looks like their trophy bag. And they're like, well, I got Demi Lovato to, to tweet about it. And it's like, well, that really doesn't mean anything because, right, yeah, no, I mean, it's not, it's not a buy on her. Kidding, you know, she's kidding. a mass media it's artist. Right. But if I'm making a purchase decision, then I want something that's closer to me. You know, I want something that I trust and feel uh, some sense of shared values with. And these, you know, big macro brands. But Taylor, she kind of over... She kind of overcame that by these she personal understa- experiences. She understood it. She yeah. understands there's an amplification. I mean, she, weekend, scaling she's the unscalable. singing Thanksgiving songs with Todrick Hall, who's you know a self-made YouTuber. Yeah. Uh, who, she gets it. Yeah. She understands where the attention yeah. is. She deploys unscalable behavior in it, which then means it gets amplified. Yeah. What's his name again? One more time. John. 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 All of what you heard in that book is still an opportunity today, as it was six years ago when I wrote it. Jamie asks, who would you recommend pitching an app idea to? What steps would you recommend? Jamie, this is an awkward question. Let's get an awkward alert here. Um, I don't know what you're going to come up with, guys, but I'm excited to see it. You know, so on my awkward alert, I mean, I don't even know what this means. I mean, this is such a basic question. I don't know why Steve loves this. He was like, I love this question. I don't love this question. Meaning, I don't know, who do you recommend pitching an app to? Well, first, if you need money, you pitch it to money people, angel investors, VCs. If you need press to get awareness because now you're out, you pitch it to the media and and, and press opportunities, influencers. Um, Listen, we know how much I love the reverse engineer thing. Actually, I want to make this a crazy link up episode. Link, don't we have like four? This is going to take you a while to get up, DRock. The Cyber Monday wine is going to be completely sold (laughs) out by the time this episode gets up. Let's put up the reverse engineer hoodie specifically because that's the one I rock uh, to the page. You know, you refer, you know, who do you pitch it to? Whoever you need at that moment. Everything you do in business life needs to be really strategic, meaning it's got to make sense. When you're, you know, who do you pitch an app to? Uh, you have an idea, but you can't code or create an app for crap, so you need to pitch a co-founder or a dev shop that you don't want to charge you a lot of money to actually build it. Then you need money, I already answered that. Then you need to get it out there, I already answered that. Then you need to sell it. So then you pitch your app to a strategic buyer. This is a very, very, and I don't, I don't want to pick on you. This is more, it, it, show Steve. This is more, more, on, more on. Can I defend myself? Yes. Okay, you, you were just on Seth Meyers because you invested in Delectable. Yeah. So if somebody thinks, well gee, I have a really cool app idea, Gary invests in apps. I think that would be why they would ask the question, right? Like, how did how did Delectable come to your attention? Uh, a VC pitched Phil, who vets my deals. It's obviously in the wine space, so it came with context. Steve is saving himself, and it's pissing me off. So I'll answer this. It's very strategic 
to understand one's history, to predict their future. Obviously coming from the wine world made me more susceptible to be interested in delectable. So that's the real answer. Hi, Gary. My name is Brent Walker and I was actually born in Russia like you were as a baby. I'm 14 years old and here's my question. I want to be an entrepreneur when I get older, but I don't know where to start. Like what action should I be taking right now as a kid? Thanks. B, listen to me. First and foremost, by asking this question and knowing what the Ask Gary V show is, you're putting yourself in a position to be an entrepreneur. I like that. What I don't like is the question because what you should know if you're a purebred entrepreneur, so wanting to be an entrepreneur versus being an entrepreneur are two very different things. And I have no interest in giving the medicine to a 14-year-old, especially because I gave the medicine to a 14-year-old Steelers fan yesterday and it wasn't pretty and I'm not proud of it. On this show is probably the second most competitive place I live in. And so what I want to tell you is this. Look, if I were you, I would sell that Under Armour sweatshirt that you're wearing in the video to some other kid in the neighborhood. I would go back in the woods in the video that you just had and find some rocks and sell them to some nine-year-old girl. That's what I did. I was that raw. Now, we're not all the same. What I'm trying to tell you is the best way to become something is to act like something. So you want to be an entrepreneur? Start acting like one. Meaning, start a business, start selling things. Both will work. Or find a mentor. Find the 18, 19, 20, 21 year old kind of entrepreneur in your neighborhood and start helping her or him out for free just to learn the hustle, to taste the game. You've got to put yourself in the position. There's no reading about entrepreneurship. There was a question today that came through for Ask Gary Vee that said, Gary, name the first, name the four best business books you've read this year. And I laughed my ass off because I don't think I've read four books in my life and definitely not four business books. And so there's no reading, my man. There's doing. And so, sell the shirt off your back. Hey guys, first and foremost, as always, humbled, thankful for you listening to the podcast. Keep hitting me up on Twitter with feedback. Also, um, really excited about something. Over the last several months, it's become uh, very clear to me that the 4Ds product that VaynerMedia has, the one-day consulting session that's $10,000, that's really... kind of going after a business doing a million, maybe 500,000 to 20 million a year in revenue has been really working. We 60 to 70% of the businesses have had ridiculous uh, ROI from the session. And so now I'm rolling it out because it clearly works. So VaynerMedia is uh, super proud to present uh, uh, the four Ds, uh, the daily digital deep dive, garyvee.com slash four D the number 4D podcast, garyvee.com, 4D podcast, if you're ready to take your business to the next level. Business to the next level.